So sorry, we're having a slight bit of technical difficulty. Well, I am. So I'm hoping you can all hear me and see me a bit better. Now, please bear with me, folks. Slightly embarrassing, but uh, a little bit of a shaky start, but hopefully that'll get us through in a second. I'm hoping you can all hear me at the moment, ladies and gents, and you can see where I am, because currently I am walking across Green Park. Now, Green Park, it's one of the seven royal parks, folks. So if you were to head in the direction of the palaces, this is where you'd come and it'll give us an amazing view of Buckingham Palace. Sorry again, folks. I hope to go uh, all that we're okay and we're live streaming now. Trial and error, but I'm sure after the first time we should be okay and it should be up and running now. Welcome to London, folks, on this glorious spring day. It's about 15 degrees Fahrenheit at the moment. I think that's around 52 degrees Celsius. So uh, I hope you're all joining me on this beautiful day in London. Still a few around just to give you an idea of where we are. I've just come out the entrance of Green Park Station and I'm heading towards the Royal Palaces. Now today we're going to take you on a centuries old journey of the thousand year old city of Westminster. To give you a rough idea of the itinerary today We'll head to the Royal Palaces first, St. James's Palace, Buckingham Palace. Then we'll have a lovely little walk through the gardens. And we'll head straight down then towards the Houses of Parliament, Westminster Abbey, the Palace of Westminster, the governing political and the spiritual heart of London. A journey up what is called the here in Britain, Boris Johnson, and our tour will conclude. So, if you are joining me today, ladies and gents, just make sure that you give us a little thumbs up that you're here and you're with us on the live stream today. Maybe you can tell us what part of the world you're from. And as we're coming through the trees here in the distance, you will see the London Home and Office. Of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II coming up Buckingham Palace. Now I want to get the best view for you possible. Now this tour usually if you were taking it with us would take about maybe two hours but there's no stopping and starting today. We'll have a little walk around and speak about the major buildings. Now this was the scene of hundreds of people this week folks due to the passing of his Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip. And of course, I'm sure some of you saw the funeral it took place on Saturday. That is why we will see today throughout our tour, the majority of the public, all the government buildings actually, and all the palaces. The flag is flying at half mast. And we'll give you a little sneaky look there, but I want to give you a little better view. Coming up in just a moment. So this is probably the best view right over here. Now, last week we couldn't access this because the press took over this immediate space. But we'll give you the beautiful gardens that have tended so well here. And we will be heading through the park, St. James's Park, which is rumoured to be the favourite of the Queen. She's often known to take a little stroll there. So there's still a number of the press out, as you can see there, folks. So Sinead is my name, you guys. I'm one of the regular tour guides here with Free Tours by... This is a tour we do quite regularly, one of the more popular, the Westminster Tour. Usually we'd have a change Fridays and Saturdays. In the middle of May. So we will be doing a live stream. So you can see the changing of the foot soldiers of Her Majesty the Queen. Now, just around the corner here. So this red brick road you see here leads all the way down if you can have a look to Trafalgar Square and that's where we'll be ending up our tour today 
But more importantly, here's Buckingham Palace. I want to get the best view here. Here we have Buckingham Palace, folks. So built in 1702 by the Duke of Buckingham, his name was John Sheffield, and it started out as Buckingham House. And the first royal family member to acquire the property Buckingham House was King George III of England, the famous last king of the Americas, who famously lost the colonies to the Americas. And it was his son, King George IV, upon ascension to the throne, inherited Buckingham House and he employed master architect John Nash to develop Buckingham House into the magnificent Buckingham Palace. But the first royal family member to officially take up residence was a very young girl who at the tender age of 18, while sharing a bedroom in fact with her mother at the time, well, she was awoken one morning in the early hours of the morning to be told she was now queen of the largest empire the world had ever seen. And that, of course, is Queen Victoria. And she did naturally what any other 18-year-old girl would do, folks. She packed her bags immediately, waved goodbye to her rather over overbearing mother, and moved on into her brand new 775-room mansion. Built on the largest private gardens in central London, the 40-acre gardens of Buckingham Palace. It has an Olympic-sized swimming pool, a post office, a helipad, a doctor's surgery, and the tennis courts all on the grounds. Now, as you can imagine, folks, uh, they're highly fortified, the walls around Buckingham Palace. And to be fair, you would think somebody would be slightly insane to even attempt a breach of security. But it did happen, and it happened in the 1980s. Michael Fagan, he scaled the walls, got into the grounds, and in 775 rooms in Buckingham Palace, he only managed to find Her Majesty's bedroom. He sat on the Queen's bed, the Queen was in her bed, and he asked the Queen, quite casually, for a light for his cigarette. Now, can you imagine the stress and duress she must have been under in the middle of the night? So the Queen handled the situation actually remarkably well. She um, spoke him down, kind of calmed him down for about 20 minutes or so, and then she rang her own security, and they eventually arrested Michael Fagan, and some say he spent a lifetime in a psychiatric unit, but essentially we believe he got out about six months later so a terrifying ordeal for the queen now this is the victoria tower by the way ladies and gents you'll see there and with queen victoria in the middle that was erected by edward the seventh her son he had the rather unfortunate nickname dirty bertie and he erected that to gain favor with his mother he wasn't the most popular of monarchs actually so to gain favor with the british public he erected the victoria memorial and uh Admiral T. Arch, which we'll be seeing later on in the tour. But for right now, this is a little stroll down the Mall, and I want to bring you to the residence of Prince Charles, the future King of England. Now, I guess the one question I get asked all the time, will Charles be the next king? Or will he just casually pass the throne over and hand it to Prince William? Never in a million years can I ever imagine that happening. Charles is the longest waiting heir in history. So I'm assuming he's quite happy and excited about assuming the role himself. He will be the next king. I guess there was one very serious abdication in the royal family, and that was in the 1930s. And that involved the queen's father and the queen's uncle. So bear with me here, you had King George V, and his son, King George VI, and his son, Edward VIII. Now, Edward VIII was the elder son, so he was scheduled to be king, and George VI, the younger brother. However, Edward VIII fell in love with a very controversial American divorcee by the name of Wallace Simpson. Now, as a constitutional monarch, actually, and head of the Church of England, he could effectively have married Wallace Simpson, but also as a constitutional monarch, he is required to accept ministerial advice. And he was strongly advised by his ministers that a two times American divorcee would never be accepted as Queen of Great Britain. So in favor of his love as Wallace Simpson, 
he abdicated the throne. Now, make no mistake about the controversy at the time, folks. Massive controversy. It almost brought down the monarchy. But that essentially is how the queen became queen because her father immediately became king, King George VI. And he was... Back to that in a minute. The White House you're looking at directly right now. And for the eagle eye observers, you might just see the bearskin soldiers. These are the members of Her Majesty's the Queen Foot Soldiers. And you have five regiments of those soldiers. You have the Scots, the Welsh, the Irish, the Coldstream Guards and the Grenadiers. Now they may look like toy soldiers to you, ladies and gents, with their Canadian bearskins, but do not underestimate these men. They've all served active tours of duty in war zones all over the world. So they are what is known as the last line of defense for Her Majesty the Queen. So basically what that means is if any situation did arise, well, the police would automatically intervene, attempt to defuse said situation by making arrests. But if necessary, these men will shoot to protect Her Majesty. That is, after all, their job, a highly coveted position. When they are hand chosen for, and it's a great honor for them to do so. Now, they are stationed here because they're protecting that White House, which is Clarence House, the official home of Prince Charles here in London, and uh, the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall, his wife, Camilla. So uh, his residence here when he is in London. Uh, we've had many sighting here, actually, of Prince Charles. You always have an idea that coming out when you see the armed escort, and we always keep an eagle eye for that. So next, I want to take you down to what is called St. James's Palace, but getting back to King George VI. So when he assumed the role of king, he, of course, was married to the Queen Mother, both the parents of the present queen. He was a tremendous king. He was the king during the bombing campaign here in World War II. And London was extensively bombed during World War II. And when monarchs were fleeing persecution all over mainland Europe from uh, of Hitler, King George VI and the Queen Mother refused to leave Buckingham Palace. They said they wanted to ride out with the British public. So it turned out to be an, a tremendous king. He himself died of lung cancer and the Queen became Queen in 1952. King George VI died very young and the Queen herself assumed the role. Very young girl. So uh, presently the longest reigning British monarch since 1066 and she assumed that title uh, the one prior to that of course was Queen Victoria and she was 1837 to 1901 63 years seven months and two days on the throne and Her Majesty surpassed that title on the 9th of September 2015 so an incredible legacy now the Queen has had a rather sad time. I think we all saw those pictures of her at the funeral on her own. But hopefully she will have a long life. Her birthday is actually Wednesday, which is the 21st of April. But the Queen has two birthdays. And why does the Queen have two birthdays? Well, I usually say it's because she's the Queen. She can have as many as she likes. But that's not the case. The official celebrations, they usually take place in June because they expect the weather would be better. And that is the official celebrations are called the Trooping the Colour. Now, I just want to show you this area here. This is St. James's Palace. The most official senior and royal working palace of them all. So Buckingham Palace actually owns And this palace was built by Henry VIII for his second wife, Anne Boleyn. She famously never saw it in its completion. However, folks, I think we all know why. Because she had her head chopped off in the Tower of London. That's why. Two years prior to its completion. Now, the balcony you see there, here in Friary Court, is where that very famous announcement is made to announce the death of a monarch and the introduction of a new one. Long live the king, or the king is dead, long live the queen, the queen is dead, long live the king. 
and it's supposed to be exceptionally bad luck for any future monarch to witness that statement in person and it happened once and I want to show you this window here and if you take a look on there's an incredible photograph of Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson staring out that looking at the time he was announced as king and of course he was king for a short period of time but was never crowned and we all know he abdicated the throne this is the palace where King Charles I of England, the only British king in history to be publicly executed, spent his very last night. And inside the courtyard here, folks, just a handy tip for you. When you're in London, this is where the beginning of the changing of the guard ceremony takes place. So what I always recommend, or if I conduct a changing of the guard tour, is that you would be situated directly across the road here. That gentleman is looking at us. It looks like I'm talking to myself, folks. And if you're situated there, you will see the soldiers assembling here. And these are where the soldiers that are going off duty. So the old guard, and they will assemble here. They'll have a uniform inspection, and then the band will come out and play some tunes. Now, it depends on whether the Queen's in or not, but I've heard them be quite giddy with their tunes when the Queen isn't in. I've heard them play Game of Thrones, the Imperial Death March, Flashdance, Beat It, Michael Jackson. I'll be there by the temptations of respect for Aretha Franklin when the Queen of Soul passed away. So it's rather fun. So what they do then is they march down this street, down the mall here, towards the gates in front of us. And then they'll take an abrupt turn. And we will have you marching alongside them, heading up to Buckingham Palace. So probably a very handy tip, the best place to see the changing of the guard. A lot of people make the mistake of heading to the gates and at the gates can tend to be quite crowded folks and to be honest most of the ceremony takes place around here you have a better view now I hope you're all enjoying the tour so far folks and I hope you can all see everything okay as I said it's a bit of trial and error for me today the first one so hopefully this will go according to plan and we a lot more live videos in the pipeline in the near future. So next I want to bring you through one of the nicest parks in London, folks. This is St. James's Park. Again, a number. And it's a beautiful little stroll down to Parliament Square and the governmental buildings and Big Ben and Westminster Abbey. So lovely day, as I mentioned, beautiful spring day. The newest arrival here at the moment actually are the parakeets. So we might see them being fed down here. There's some very strange stories as to how they arrived. Some suggested that uh, in times gone by, the rich had this rather bizarre custom of ex gifting each other with exotic birds and animals. So they believe a few of them escaped and that's why we have them in the park today. Another suggestion I heard actually on from rock and roll history was it was Jimi Hendrix had some in his aviary in his own home and he released them to the wild so either way they're a lovely addition now you'll see a lot of people out and about enjoying the good weather we're going to take a little stroll over the bridge here that will give us some beautiful views of the palace through the trees and another park called Horse Guards Parade. Now apologies to anyone who joined us at the beginning. We were slightly, I was having a bit of technical difficulty. I am trying to embrace all this new technology. I tend to be better as a guide in person I guess than, uh, but hopefully it's all going according to plan for you here. Oh here they are you guys so you'll get to see them feeding the beautiful parakeets here. There you go, we get a good zoom in here. This chap might let us have a little look for you there. Look how pretty they are. Isn't they beautiful? This guy here. They're lovely, aren't they? There's a couple up there as well. Some of the best fed animals in London. We're not encouraged to feed them, but we do anyway. The squirrels. 
The poor pigeons are getting nothing. Okay, well, that's our newest addition to the park. Now, this beautiful bridge here, folks, I just want to show you the views on either side. This is a perfect spot for a selfie. Now, I'll take a little view here. I'll get out of the way. Okay. So off in the distance, there are folks, you'll see the London Eye. And this building here to the left is Horse Guards Parade. But I'll show you a bit more of that later on. All the swans and all the animals in the park are said to be the property of the Queen. So I am obliged to genuflect along the way. I'm kidding, not really, folks. Okay, so that takes us over the bridge. And take a nice, pleasant stroll through St. James's Park. Now, big tradition here in London is picnics in the park. You are welcome to do so. There's a lot of people out and about enjoying their picnics today, but I want to show you a few more. I want to show you the pelicans of the park as well beautiful views along the way so that truly is in my opinion the beauty of this great city you're in one of the busiest metropolises in the world and you're in the middle of the hustle and bustle and the mania of the city of london but you're only ever always like 10 minutes walking distance from a beautiful open green space where you can literally get away from it all lounge in one of the many deck chairs they provide in Green Park or Hyde Park and get a, and literally feel like you're in the British countryside in central London so it's a wonderful contrast for all of us living here in London and in the summertime they open up the Lido so you can do some outdoor swimming in the parks Hampstead Heath the Serpentine in Hyde Park is a swimming section as well so there's plenty to do here in the summertime. But this one is all about relaxing right in the centre of central London. Now we're heading in very shortly to the governing, political and the spiritual heart of London. Centuries and centuries and centuries of history coming up in one immediate area. The House of Lords, the House of Commons, Westminster Abbey, the Palace of Westminster, Victoria Tower, the Treasury, and of course, the iconic Big Ben. Big Ben is under extensive renovation at the moment. So I will try to get a picture of one side of the clock face for you. It's actually blue. Apparently it's its original color, but after the years of pollution, it looked appeared to look like it was black. So they're getting four new clock faces. It's a good day to come out and about during the week, folks. Saturdays and Sundays are super busy. So you can really get a feel of the park and how peaceful it is. This time of the day. So it's the 19th of April here, folks. As I mentioned, about 15 degrees today. It's about 51 Fahrenheit, I believe. It's a beautiful temperature. A big stroll around London. Now look in there, isn't that gorgeous? So this is usually where the pelicans hang out, but I can't seem to see them today. And you can come to the park and see the ranger feeding the pelicans. I believe it's something like two o'clock in the day. There's a picture of them there. There's quite a few of them, unless we see a few up here. But let's keep going. We'll see the sharp contrast now between the park and the governmental buildings, these stunning buildings coming up. The first one we're about to see is the Treasury, which is home to what we call here the Chancellor of the Exchequer, 
for the Minister for Finance, Rishi Sunak. So this technically is the back of Whitehall and we will be heading up Whitehall as well. So you won't be missing out today. So a little look here at the park before we head away. <laughs> okay, so one of the more famous Prime Ministers, of course, arguably one of the most famous Prime Ministers in the UK was Winston Churchill. And Churchill recently was played, well not recently, I think it's about four years ago now, is it? But Gary Oldman won the Oscar for playing Churchill in the darkest hour. Well, they did a lot of filming here in one of the most popular attractions in London. I'm coming towards it here. The Churchill War Rooms. Now, these are the underground bunkers and offices where Churchill commanded and coordinated the troops from during World War II. Let's see where the two chaps are standing directly in front of it there. So it's obviously opened up again. Now, it's a wonderful interactive display. You can walk through yourself, it's self-guided. And you'll see the maps, the coordinates used, the war council room, his bedroom, his wife's bedroom. It's an incredible place down there. And Churchill himself stood on the roof of that very building you see there, the Treasury, watching bombs raining down in London during the Blitz. He was heard screaming and shouting, whatever you save, save St. Paul's Cathedral. And so they did with very little damage. And St. Paul's, of course, is in the city of London. We are presently, just to specify, we're in the city of Westminster. And the city of Westminster is 1,000 years old. The city of London, where you associate London Bridge and Tower Bridge and St. Paul's Cathedral and the financial district, is 2,000 years old. And that was established by the Romans in AD 43. So it's what a lot of the most ancient historic part of Greater London is the city of London. But years later, they built up the city of Westminster, more of a playground for kings and queens of Britain. And one of the first buildings that was built on the marshes of the West Bank was the Minster in the West. Westminster Abbey. Minster, the former name for an abbey. Now we're just taking the back streets here, folks. When you head straight into Parliament, you can also go through that way. If you look in the background there, but I want to bring you to the best view of Westminster Abbey. So if you take a look there, there is Big Ben. But we'll get a much better view in a moment. Let me just cross over here. There's method in my madness, I assure you, folks. I think some people tend to think I'm bringing them the wrong way when I bring them on tour here, but it's a, a much better view. We're heading in the direction of Westminster Abbey and Westminster School. It's a pleasure to have the streets to ourselves at the moment. Okay. So you'll see off in the distance there. These beautiful buildings we're approaching. And while it's technically the governing political and spiritual part of London. Minster in the West. So our newest venture here folks, keep an eye out as we're going to be live streaming from all over London in the next few weeks indefinitely. 
I'm Sinead, I'm one of the regular tour guides here with free tours by foot. My tours include Westminster, City of London, Jack the Ripper, Rock and Roll Tour, the Food Tour in the East End, and all day tours as well. I'm just trying to think, is there anything else I do? Soho Piccadilly Circus in Chinatown, yeah, that's another one. So it's great to be out and about. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to bring you directly across the road here towards Westminster School and we'll get the proper view of Westminster Abbey. Now, you'll see the pedestrian crossing here. I know that it tends to confuse some people. I think the rules are different in certain countries, but traffic is obliged to give away to you in London for a pedestrian crossing. So you don't have to wait. And we have a green man, which is excellent. This is a novel way. This chap should not have moved. But anyway. So. There she is, folks. Incredible. Minster in the West. Westminster Abbey. Now, there's been a site of Christian worship on this site, folks, for over one thousand years. King William the Conqueror of England rode his horse up the Isle of Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day. Just one second there to the bike passage. Christmas Day 1066. On that day folks he declared himself King of England. Ever since every king and queen in British history with the exception of only two have all been crowned inside the Westminster Abbey, including Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. Kate married William in here. Lady Diana's very somber funeral was held in here. Mary Queen of Scots, Queen Elizabeth I, Newton, Purcell, Darwin, Dickens, Chaucer, Henry Hardy, Pitt the Elder, Pitt the Younger, Browning, Tennyson, to name only, only a few, actually, of over 3,000 of the most influential people are all buried inside in Westminster Abbey. I'll show you the front in just a second, but this is Westminster School. In Westminster School, usually we'll be able to take a little walk, and we will in another month's time, when we're officially allowed inside buildings again. In a month's time, we'll be heading through the back here and that will take us around to the best view of the Houses of Parliament but right now it's closed but it's one of the most prestigious public schools in Great Britain now to confuse you further public in this country is private the state schools are the public schools the public schools are the private schools I have confused you and I've actually confused myself I never really get it but that's the idea so some very influential people have went to school here. Sir Christopher Wren, the architect of St. Paul's Cathedral and 51 churches in the city of London. Robert Hooke, his assistant, attended school here, as did A.A. A. Milne, the author of Winnie the Pooh. Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber, the famous composer, of course, found to be the opera, to name one of his more famous. And rather well, surprisingly, actually, but a lot of people don't know him. Now, I'm Irish, obviously, with a name like Sinead O'Leary, and my accent kind of tends to give it away as well. Sinead, like Sinead O'Connor, by the way. Over the years, I've been Shinehead, Smead, Cyanide. That was my favorite. Um, Shane McGowan, he's the lead singer of an Irish band called The Pogues. He attended school there. He won a scholarship. It's a reputation of being a bit of a wild cat, so he was actually expelled after six months. There's no big surprise there. Now, this is the Abbey. Now, you'll soon be able to visit inside as well. The Abbey is opening up again in the middle of May. So everything is opened up again in London, pretty much. Just the indoor attractions will be all starting in May. Tickets to get in there is about £19.50, but here's a handy tip. You can also, you're welcome to attend any Christian service here in London. And one of the more beautiful services is called Evensong, and that takes place 
you'll need to check just to make sure, but it was usually five o'clock every day. And it's a wonderful prayer service inside the Abbey. Where you'll hear the same, well, the Westminster Boys Choir. Just one second, folks. Sorry, that's super loud. Uh, the Westminster School Boys Choir performing there, and it's a beautiful 45 minute prayer service. And you can, you're welcome to attend that, and I would strongly recommend you do so. It's one of the nicest things you can do when you're here in London. Now, usually the queue would start right at the back of the Abbey where we just started, and you might queue up for 15 or 20 minutes because it is very popular and it's a free service. So, here's a handy tip. Now, that beautiful small little quaint church you see here is St. Margaret's Church. And this is uh, technically the politician's church. Winston Churchill married his beloved Clementine in here. Samuel Pepys married in here. Samuel Pepys was a famous British diarist who recorded the Great Fire of London. It was the very reason we know so much about the Great Fire of London, which occurred in 1666. And the city of London, 80% of the entire city burned to the ground. So that's Samuel Pepys was married in here. And Sir Walter Raleigh, is buried inside in this beautiful little building. As is William Caxton, of course, the inventor of the printing press. Now, straight ahead of us, I'm gonna have to take a little detour here on the right. Folks, usually I would come around the back of the buildings, but that's okay, we can improvise. London is all about improvising, but just as we're here, I just wanna show you the actual square itself. This is Parliament Square and it's adorned with statues of prime ministers and presidents from all over the world. So in the square is David Lloyd George, George Canning, Mahatma Gandhi, Jan Smuts, and the most famous one, just to name a few, and the first female to be in Parliament Square is Millicent Fawcett. And she was given the great honor of the first female of Parliament Square in Bear with me. 1918 was the suffragettes again. So 2018. And it was to celebrate the centenary of the suffragettes and securing the right for women to vote here in Britain in 1918. So Millicent Fawcett was a pacifist with the... Ooh, what's going on down here, you guys? Let's go have a look. A lot of police down here. So the red vans that we're approaching in a moment are the arm place. It's just a bit of security in this area. Because I just want to give you a really good view of that beautiful tower in the background. That's the Victoria Tower. Now, so Big Ben is over here. You'll see under extensive renovation there. I will show you a clock face very shortly. Um, one of his clock faces that's um, been revealed. But the Victoria Tower. Now, firstly, Big Ben. Not to keep jumping between both, but I'll connect them now in just a minute. A lot of people tend to think Big Ben is the clock. Big Ben is the bell inside in the clock tower, the 13 and a half ton bell inside the clock tower. And the tower itself, quite simply, was known as the clock tower. However, in the Diamond Jubilee of the Queen in 2012, 60 years on the throne, marking 60 years on the throne, it was renamed the Elizabeth Tower. And that is the precise reason that this tower is the Victoria Tower, named after Queen Victoria, who is the only other monarch who reached a Diamond Jubilee of 60 years on the throne. So, the Victoria Tower is home to the exclusive entrance of the Queen. You'll see this semicircular entrance there. And she'll enter through once a year. She'll come dressed in the crown jewels. An incredible day out here in London. She'll arrive in a beautiful parade of royal carriages surrounded by the horse guards of the Queen. And she'll come to officially open the Houses of Parliament. These are the House of Lords and the House of Commons, the governing body here in Great Britain. Again, 
under extensive renovation. Um, actually, it's supposed to be quite dangerous. The plumbing and the uh, electrics and everything in there, well, it's a Victorian building, so it needs to be updated. So there's a big, massive extension going on there, improving the building. And I believe there's supposed to be ravaged with asbestos as well, so a huge operation that's taking place. But the building is the Palace of Westminster. It's not the original building. The first house of Parliament was burned to the ground in a destructive fire. And in 1834, Charles Barry and Augustus Pugin were commissioned to rebuild the Palace of Westminster. But amazingly, one part of the original building survived. And that is directly what we're looking at right now. This wider part of the building is Westminster Hall, the older part of the Palace of Westminster. Now, in that very building, ladies and gents, is where King Charles I of England, the only British king in history to be to death by that man. You can see the black statue there, Oliver Cromwell. I'm going to cross over so you can get a better view. In that very building is where Guy Fawkes of the gunpowder plot assassination attempt was condemned to death. In that very building is where William Wallace of Braveheart fame was also condemned to death inside in that building. It's where kings and queens are laid in state when they pass away. And the last royal family member to be laid in state here was Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen's mother. Would you believe people queued nearly 12 hours to walk past her body that was laid in state in there? The public are usually allowed to pay their respects. Now that's a better view. Sorry about all the noise, folks. I have been looking for comments, but unfortunately I must have done something wrong. But I will do the best I can to make sure that I can see your comments in future. Um, just bear with me there and I'll see if I can... Just make sure that you leave us little comments in the section underneath. I apologize if I'm a little bit technologically challenged. But I'll get there. So hopefully you're joining us from different parts of the world. Please be sure to tell us where you're from and if you have any questions I'll come back to them after the tour and I'll do my best to answer them for you so there's Big Ben not very attractive at the moment unfortunately we estimate it could take another two years and who knows maybe delayed a little bit further just want to angle you around a bit better there exactly always a few demonstrators some will, oh, this is the guy who demonstrates about plastic, plastic use. Now, to give you a better view here of Parliament Square from where we are, to the Abbey in St. Margaret's Church, we'll just do a circular view around through Parliament. And there's the man himself, Winston Churchill. Quite witty, actually, Churchill could be. He always had a sharp response for everyone. But most notably, a lady called Lady Nancy Astor. Now, Lady Nancy Astor was the first woman to take her seat in the House of Commons. First female member of Parliament, so a pretty big deal. But Nancy Astor and Churchill were friends, but they never really saw eye to eye. I think he liked to antagonize her because she got annoyed very quickly. I think he kind of enjoyed that. So one particular morning, she's furious with Churchill. Uh, it's just a bit noisy for a minute, folks. Just bear with me a second and I'll continue that as soon as it kind of... I'm sure you can all hear me properly. That's a bit better. So one particular morning, she's furious with Churchill and she said to him, Winston Churchill, sir, if you were my husband, I would poison you with cyanide. And Winston Churchill immediately replied, 
Lady Nancy Astor, if you were my wife, I would gladly drink it. So always a witty retort or a sharp response from Churchill. Now, the reason I'm taking you this direction is I want to bring you around by the river just ever so shortly, just for a small little journey. I want to show you the London Eye, but I also want to show you the new clock face. We'll try and see if we can screenshot it in for you. Now, straight ahead of me, if I wasn't turning left, is Westminster Bridge, folks. And that connects you over there towards County Hall. But I'll show you those buildings in a minute, sorry. I'm just So there's the clock face. I'm probably a bit pointless, but I did try. You just see the blue new clock face there. So shiny and new, we've four new ones that are coming our way. Head straight up here. Just angle you better again. There we go. And we'll take a little short journey here. Actually, this is the Houses of Parliament, Port Collis House. And this is where you can get tickets to go to inside the Houses of Parliament. And trust me, folks, it's spectacular in there. Especially the House of Lords. It's the closest you'll get to a royal throne. There's a throne of the Queen in there that she uses during the state opening of Parliament address. And directly in front of you, the London Eye. So we're walking alongside the river. This is Victoria Embankment along here. So the London Eye, there are 32 pods on the London Eye to represent 31 boroughs and the city of London. Originally, sorry, whenever I go a little quiet, folks, it's just because there's a super noisy truck and I wanna make sure you can hear me. So originally at this time of construction, it was the largest observation wheel in the world. That's since been surpassed by the one in Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. And I believe that one is going to be outbuilt by the Super Eye, which is in Dubai. So the London Eye, one of the most popular attractions in London. Um, originally constructed just for the celebrations of the millennium. So it wasn't meant to be here still, but now apparently the plans are to keep it in the skyline until 2025. But to be honest, folks, I can't see it going anywhere in the near future. Now the building behind it there is County Hall. That big gray building you see there. They were the former offices of uh, government offices or of the council. Margaret Thatcher closed them down, but now for the kids particularly, and any of you families that are watching you looking for something to do with the children in London, it's home to Shrek Adventure World. It's home to the main offices of the London Eye, the London Dungeon. It takes you through exhibits of Jack the Ripper and Sweeney Todd and the Great Plague and the Great Fire. And on top of the building, which always makes me laugh, is one of the best sushi restaurants in London. And underneath it is the aquarium. So at the very least, you'll know your fish is fresh, folks. The London Aquarium has an amazing shark exhibit in there. And there's a beautiful hotel in the building as well. So it's a great hotel to stay in in Westminster because your alarm clock essentially is Big Ben. There's the Hungerford Bridge. That's the Golden Jubilee footbridge side, and behind it is the actual Hungerford Bridge that connects you to from Embankment Station straight over to Waterloo Station, so connecting the North and the South Bank. Now, the reason I brought you around here is there is New Scotland Yard, which technically is New, New, New Scotland Yard, the third new. Scotland Yard and that is the home of the Metropolitan Police Department. That's two on Judy. 
You will have seen this iconic New Scotland Yard sign several times in movies, particularly Sherlock Holmes. It's uh, the, new, new, the New Scotland Yard. The name actually is originally from a street name here in London called Scotland Yard. So nothing too interesting, I know, in relation to Scotland. Here's the Ministry of Defence. Rumoured to be, this is a Ministry of Defence building, so the building responsible for the country's security. Rumoured to be taller underground than it is above ground. And apparently, let's just say a rather cliched uh, word on the street, as they say, from other guides I've heard, that there is a secret underground road network in London which connects the Ministry of Defence with Downing Street, across the road where we're headed next, Buckingham Palace, and the Grand Old Duke of York Colium on Trafalgar Square, or in, uh, on the Mall, apologies, on the way to the palace. And they say that they could successfully get the Queen and the Prime Minister out of London if any major catastrophe occurred. They could get her out underground without even coming above ground. Now, the interesting thing about this area is the TV city in the world. There are more video surveillance cameras in London than any other city in the world. I think the last count was something near 415,000. And to be honest, if I were a gambling woman, I would take a bet alone. So. Heavy security here. There is the Ministry of Defence. And we're approaching what is called Whitehall. Whitehall is the corridor of power. Home to the Cenotaph, 10 Downing Street, Horse Guards Parade, the Cabinet Rooms, the Scottish Office, the Welsh Office, the Admiralty, all on this very street. And of course, the home. Boris Johnson, and the Prime Minister. He's been home to Prime Ministers in this country since 1730. In fact, the very first Prime Minister to set up residence here was Robert Walpole. And more on that to come in a minute, I'll cross the road, but I want to show you something else first. And that is in the centre of the road behind this number 88 bus. Actually, we'll cross the road and walk down there so you can get a really good view. Let's give you a full view of where we are. This is Whitehall. We'll do a bit of jaywalking, why not? This is the Cenotaph. This is the most important British war memorial in the world, dedicated to every fallen soldier from any British conflict. It's where the Queen and the Royal Family and extended members of the Royal Family, heads of state of the Commonwealth, the Prime Minister, and all the major politicians and thousands of army veterans will attend on Whitehall here to a ceremony on Remembrance Day every year, and they lay the wreaths of poppies. The cenotaph. And we're going to head across here then to the home number 10 Downing Street. So as you can see it's quite a pleasurable walk folks. It's, it's an easy walk too. It's, it's all very straightforward. We're coming in one big circle and one loop around. That's what we're doing. So, but technically if you have a bigger group we do a lot of stopping and starting and but today it's just a lovely little meander around the city of Westminster now oh, there's the security behind the gates and if you take a look up there on the right hand side you'll see Downing Street now just to show you where it actually is 
So I need you to be a bit observant. Look up the back, right in the corner there. You'll see that orange looking building with the black door. That's number 11. Number 10 is the blue one right beside it there to the right of it. That's the home of the Prime Minister. But technically, depending on the size of the Prime Minister's family, trying to get you back down again, if they tend to swap sometimes. Number 11 is the home of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Number 10 is the home of Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of Great Britain. But if their families are rather large, the Prime Minister will tend to swap. So the likes of Tony Blair and David Cameron lived at number 11, Downing Street. So the chaps are hard at work there today, ladies and gents. Like a non-stop boys, very busy. <laughs> tend to be as nice as I can to men that carry weapons that size. Now, love this, folks. Have a look here on the right. I'll bring you closer again anyway. This is an amazing memorial to the women of World War II. Now, they're all the uniforms they would have worn during World War II. So you need to remember that when the men were called to World War II in this country, all the men were gone, they were all called to war. So the women actually stepped up and they took over things like construction and financing and policing and the politics and the governing and the mechanics and well, everything. The ladies ran the country. So even the queen herself got involved in the war effort. Uh, the queen, Her Majesty the Queen and her sister, Princess Margaret, trained as mechanics, so they're qualified mechanics, which is a rather interesting fact. She's a pretty resourceful lady. Uh, the bridge, one of the bridges over the River Thames as well, incidentally, was Waterloo Bridge. And that's nicknamed by Londoners as the Ladies' Bridge of London. Because when the men were called, construction on that bridge had already begun, so the ladies stepped up. They donned their construction belts, they got out their tools, and off they went to work. So the bridge was mostly constructed by the ladies of London. So it's absolutely no surprise then to me or any other lady on this tour, that to this day, that bridge is the only bridge in London that was ever finished on time and under budgets. Under budget that was, ladies. I don't know if the gentleman will agree with me on that one, but it always gets a little giggle. Now, this is Horse Guards Parade. So remember I showed you the back of this when we were on Westminster Bridge, but what I'm gonna do is usually I just go straight up to the square, but I think I'll bring you around the back here today. So I just wanna show you. These are the Horse Guards of Her Majesty the Queen. Now they're on duty presently. These are the Blues and Royals. Members of the Household Cavalry. Now the Blues and Royals, their uniform is wonderful, are responsible for security here. At this side, you have the former ceremonial entrance of the Royal Domain. You'll see what I mean in a moment. These chaps are on duty here for an hour at a time. Members, former members of the Blues and Royals Regiment would have been Prince William and Prince Harry. Prince Harry served time in the Afghanistan with the Blues and Royals. So these are kind of the private security of the Queen. Never see you see the Queen out and about in the Royal Carriage. There, she's always surrounded by the Household Cavalry. Now you have the Blues and Royals and you also have the Lifeguards. Their um, uniform is different. Let me just show you the building here. This is Horse Guards Parade. And the lifeguards, a former member of the lifeguards, actually, interestingly enough, was James Blunt, the singer. Um, he's a lot of fun, actually, if you follow him on Twitter. So that's why you'll see he's so friendly with uh, Prince William and Prince Harry. They were all members of the Household Cavalry Horse Guards of the Queen. So he always shows up at the royal weddings, etc. Now, this is Horse Guards Parade out Sorry. here. So not only do we have the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace, but just be advised also, the changing of the guard also takes place at the Tower of London, at Windsor Castle and St. James's Palace. 
But here, at Horse Guards Parade, is where the Horse Guards change takes place. And that will be starting up again in May, but it's every day for the Horse Guards. So right here at 11 a.m., so I would suggest you be here for about 10.40, there is a guard change between both regiments of horse guards. One goes on duty, one goes off duty. Every day at 11, except for Sunday. Sunday it takes place at 10 a.m. So the building I'm focused on right now is the Admiralty. This is the building of the horse guards, horse guards parade. They have stables in there as well. The horses are Irish blacks and they're bred in Ireland especially for Her Majesty's service. They work exceptionally hard. Now, just a quick mention, behind those trees there is the back of Downing Street. There was reports of a rather wild party that took place there at the time that David Cameron hosted Barack Obama. They had a, a barbecue and people said there was a lot of shouting and dancing and laughing and music could be heard. Sounds a bit wild. Anyway, getting back to a horse guards parade, as I mentioned, of oh, the Irish blacks. So the Irish blacks, I tend to wander a little bit, folks. Because they work so hard every year, they actually get a vacation. Now, people don't believe me when I say this, but they, um, it is 100% true. They rent a private beach for them, the horses in Norfolk, where they have three weeks off. Their soldiers tend to go with them, but they let them ride bare back down the sand and they frolic in the water and they come back to us all tanned and full of margaritas and ready for another season. So you can Google that actually and have a look and see them having the time of their lives. So as you can see, we're at the back now of St. James's. So earlier on, we came through St. James's over the left-hand corner of the screen there. And we came over to the cabinet war rooms of Churchill. So this is just horse guards. Now this is also where Henry VIII used to joust here. It's also where the beach volleyball events actually in the Olympic Games in London in 2012 took place. Just another little bit of trivia for you. London is the only city in the world to have hosted the Games three times. Once in 1908, once in 1948 and once in 2012. Now there's an original World War II bunker, folks, right there the Citadel and apparently there are top secret Ministry of Defence laboratories underground here as well. Now it's rumoured to be one of the only buildings, one of the only structures rather in the world not to be visible on Google Maps but correct me if I'm wrong. Sometimes there's a great saying in the guide community, don't let the truth get in the way of a really good story. I'm joking, technically. Now, straight ahead of you, the Grand Old Duke of York had 10,000 men. He marched them up and down the hill, then he marched them down again. Famous British nursery rhyme here. He was one of 13 children of Mad King George III of England, the famous last King of the Americas. He made him head of the military for a period of time, but in that nursery rhyme you'll hear, when he was up, he was up. And when he was down, he was down. I think that referred to the fact that he suffered from bipolar folks. Another brother of his was George IV of England. He was known as Georgie Porgy, putting in pie. And he had another brother called Silly Billy. That was William IV. So there's a memorial to the memorial and that will take us back out onto the mound <laughs> towards Admiralty Arch here so earlier on I mentioned Edward the seventh erected a lot of memorials to gain British favour with the British public. It wasn't the most popular of kings, and this is one of them. 
and this has the exclusive entrance of the royal family so in the middle there you'll see the gated entrance right in the center that's only used by the royal family usually it's open at the moment because they're doing some work on it but it's usually closed and only open to the royal family so when the royal family are attending any special events they'll come all the way from the palace down the end of the road here through those gates and they're usually heading down towards Parliament. It's opened up to the public on very special occasions every year. And those would include the London Marathon. And they were opened up for the Olympic Games as well. That's actually being converted into a hotel, folks. It's been bought. And it's... If you walk through there, you'll come straight out onto Trafalgar Square. Now, I forgot to mention the Admiralty to you there when we were in Horse Guards Parade. You will have seen that big building that's the back of it there. Chief Officers of the Navy here in London. A young man that worked in there actually, where we believe he got many an inspiration for his crime novels to come. There's a young man called Sir Ian Fleming. Who you'll all know is the author of the most famous spy in the world, James Bond another memorial there to the Royal Marines. But did you know Ian Fleming also wrote Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, folks? Another little bit of pub quiz trivia, shall we say, really useless trivia. So this is going to take us out here towards Trafalgar Square. Now we'll just be crossing over in here. I'll bring you right into the middle of Trafalgar Square. But you will notice you're here. The most notable feature is Nelson's Column. Now we'll have a little walk around here. And I'll show you a few bits. Across the square. Now there's amazing places to eat around here. One in particular I love is right directly underneath that church. And that church there in the corner is St. Martin in the Fields Church. I'm trying to maximize it there for you. There's a beautiful restaurant underneath called the Crypt. A bit of a local secret. But you actually end up eating on tunes, folks, but they have a wonderful buffet, salad bar, you get a glass of wine at lunchtime, so it's kind of a, one of London's best kept secrets. Okay. Now, just a point of interest there as well for you, this is the Canadian High Commission here in London known as a high commission and not an embassy because it's still part of the Commonwealth. But right at one of the entrances down the end there is actually where the White Star ticket line offices were located for over how many hundred something years ago. Sorry. You could have got your ticket for the Titanic. your ticket there ladies and gents for the Titanic inside this very building here so the morning after the Titanic sung concerned passengers were requesting the passenger list from their family members uh, to see if their family members were on board it's an interesting story actually about the Waldorf Astoria well the Waldorf Hotel here but it's the Waldorf Astoria in New York Inside the Waldorf here in London is a room called the Great Palm Court Room and it's beautiful inside there, my apologies. Inside there, it was designed by a chap called Alexander Marshall Mackenzie who also designed the interior of the Titanic. 
also looks very similar and they did a lot of the filming of the movie Titanic with Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio in that very room. You can visit that when you're in London too, but this is Nelson's Collier. Now Trafalgar Square first gets its name from the famous Battle of Trafalgar. And the victor of the Battle of Trafalgar is that gentleman on top of the column, Admiral Lord Horatio Nelson. Now he defeated the combined Spanish and French fleets in the Battle of Trafalgar. And those four black plaques you see at the base of the column are made of French cannon and they're to depict his four most famous victories. And they were the bombardment of Copenhagen, the Battle of the Nile, the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, and the Battle of Trafalgar. Now he famously lost his life, however, in the Battle of Trafalgar. Nelson was killed by sniper fire in the first 20 minutes of action. Now, ordinarily, these admirals would be buried at sea, but Nelson was such a highly decorated officer, they wanted to return his body and have a state funeral for him in St. Paul's Cathedral. So how do you preserve a body for three weeks on board a ship returning? They pickled his body in a vat of brandy. Not the best of ideas, as you can imagine, on a ship full of soldiers, because of, by the time the brandy returned, it had seriously depleted. And that's because, quite literally, the soldiers on board had decided they were going to have one last drink with their admiral. I kid you not. Now, the four most photographed lines in the world, here are the Trafalgar Square lines on each column, uh, corner of the column, to depict the four quarters of the British Empire. The favorite artist of Queen Victoria was a gentleman called Edwin Lancier. He was commissioned to sculpt these lions, but he'd never actually seen a lion. So they got him the body of a dead lion from London Zoo. And he began sculpting the beautiful face and mane of the lion, but by the time he came to sculpting the body of the lion, well, the body of the dead lion, <coughs> excuse me, had become very badly decomposed. So he actually modeled the bodies of the world's most photographed lions on that of his golden retriever dog. And if you do look closely at them, you'll see those hind legs. I've never seen a lion with hind legs like that. So the face and mane of a lion and the body of a golden retriever in albums all over the world. St. Martin in the Fields Church, the parish church, as I mentioned earlier on, of the royal family. It's where Prince Charles was baptized. And directly in front of you, an amazing view of the National Gallery, housing one of the finest collections of Western European art in the world, but also one of the finest collections of Renaissance art in the world, outside of Italy, of course, not to offend any Italians, artists like Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Van Gogh, Monet, Cezanne, Renoir, even inside in the National Gallery free of charge and behind it the National Portrait Gallery offering over 200,000 portraits inside in the gallery and the majority of our museums and galleries in London are free of charge. So that's Chicago Square folks and I'm coming to the end of the live stream for today. I want to thank you most sincerely for joining me. If you have enjoyed the tour my name is Sinead and if you haven't enjoyed the tour, let's say my name is Jose. It's been a pleasure, folks. It's my first live stream. I really do hope it went according to plan. I'm sorry I didn't see any of your comments. I'm sure that's some mistake of mine, but I will rectify it by the next time. Please like and subscribe, you guys, because I intend to do quite a few more of these. We'll be doing the rock and roll tours. We'll be heading into demonstrations and protests, walking along the South Bank. And if you have enjoyed the tour, give me a thumbs up if you have any questions, ladies and gents, after the tour. I'm so sorry I couldn't interact with you personally on this one, but I will in the future. Don't hesitate to leave them underneath. Thanks again. It's been a pleasure guiding you around, folks. Hope to see you in the near future. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Free Tours by Foot London. I hope you enjoyed our Westminster tour. Thanks for joining me. Signing out from London.